Hello. So, uh, I've been working on a little project. I've been doing a whole lot of lighting work. Things have gotten a lot bigger. Here's a couple of recent things, just little clips of some stuff we've been working on. So it's been fun, but at a recent gig, I was bragging about MA3 to someone and how happy I, I really am with it. You know, I have a little MA rig with the MA node. It's about the cheapest way you can properly get into MA. But I was bragging to them about it, and they were watching me program. And they saw me going to these encoders and scrolling to change them. And they had commented wondering why I used my touchscreen or my trackpad to adjust these instead of mapping them to MIDI, like the rest of the playbacks. And I had to explain to them that I used to be able to control these over OSC and by extension MIDI through Show Cockpit, but MA at some point decided that that was not... Uh, well, their, our, their reasoning was that they removed it for compatibility purposes. Sure, Jan. Um, so... You know. Um, anyway, that got me thinking that I do often, while programming, especially when trying to program quickly, kind of battle these encoders on screen. 
it would be real nice to be able to access them through hardware, but like I said, they do not offer OSC access anymore. They, they outright removed it. So we have to get a little bit creative. So the way we're going to do that is that MA, MA3, I think 2 has it too, but MA3 has this web remote. So if I go to network, you'll see this web remote. And this is actually the secret little device you'll see here in a moment. But if I go ahead and open up a browser, let's go here, looking at Ethernet chipsets, and you'll see why shortly. So if I go to, let's see, that ought to do it. Okay. This is actually my MA session. So if I change this encoder here, you'll see that that changes. It's super responsive, maybe a little bit of delay, but it's really good. Something I have come to learn is that if you can access something in your web browser, you can almost always, in fact, I can't really think of a case in which you wouldn't be able to access it programmatically with any piece of software you might want. I mean, by extension, really any device you might want. So if I go ahead and open up the developer tools here, we can go ahead and look at our network tab. I'm going to refresh because it's not uh, recording it yet. We'll see this little WebSockets connection pop up here. So that is the session that is powering this. And their implementation is actually pretty neat. Uh, you'll see there are all kinds of messages going back and forth really, 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 really fast. So they are actually sending up a video stream that the MA console, be it a computer or an actual console, is generating. It's, it's basically making like a new window and streaming it up to the browser. And then in return... The browser is sending back mouse position, key events. Um, I don't know if you can see those. They go by so fast. Um, different types of mouse events. So if I filter for key, and if I go up here, see all those key events? Let me close that. If I filter for mouse, yep, you'll see the mouse moving around. Interestingly, you'll see if I scroll, and if I go over an encoder and scroll, you'll see that all it does is send it a position and a delta Y. So uh, let me change that to a different filter. Oh, uh, Chrome does not enjoy all of these messages. Okay, so this mouse event wheel, you see this delta Y? As I scroll my mouse wheel, that delta Y either goes up or down. One message for every click of the wheel. So that's something we could take advantage of. So if we send it a position, and a delta Y value with a WebSocket connection, we can change those encoder wheels. And that's actually pretty easy, particularly because the implementation they've used for the browser to control the console is actually extremely simple. All you have to do is set a window size. So if I clear this, it's going to take a second and think because it's a ton of messages again. Thinking, thinking, thinking. See if I can get that to settle down. Oh my, it's unhappy. Okay. Let me go back to this. Whoops. Let's refresh here. Okay. So, if I filter to resize, you'll see if I drag this window around a little bit, it sends a resize command. So that's something we can send. So let's say we set this window to something sort of arbitrary, right? So let's say maybe 1,200 by, I don't know, 300. And then we go over each of the encoder wheels. Let me uh, make that a little better. There we go. We go over each of the encoder wheels and scroll. So let me change this to wheel. We go over each of the encoder wheels and scroll. And just take note of the values for each of those. So let me go to something that's uh, going to let us change all the wheels. If we do that, we can record all those messages and then throw them into a little script that can send WebSocket commands. And that script could run on basically anything. In this case, it's a MicroPython script written to run on this little Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, this Raspberry Pi Pico has connected to it four rotary encoders. Bog standard, super simple. This is the Pico W. 
So it has Wi-Fi built in. And uh, as you might imagine, those are not actually my credentials. I put in uh, filler data, and I'll split this out into a config file along with the uh, address of the console. But anyway, so this script connects to the Wi-Fi, sends a WebSocket connection request to the console in the appropriate address, and then sends a request to resize the video. Now, notably, it doesn't actually request a video stream, so we're not sending all of that video data to the Pi to deal with. Really, we'd just have to throw it out, but that would still probably be pretty intensive on this little uh, Pi Pico. From there, we go ahead and initialize all of the encoders. They are utilizing the Rotary IRQ library. I'll have a link to that in the description, along with the micro uh, WebSockets client. So it sets up a couple values to use throughout the script, and then we jump into this while loop. In this while loop, we set this new encoder value to equal the value set by the Rotary IRQ library, and then check to see if that new value is different than the old value. If it is, that means we have to go ahead and set a command. So we calculate the difference between the values so that we know how many clicks effectively to send to MA. And then we just go ahead and set this text here to be equal to the text version of this number, this diff, using this format string here. From there, we send it across the WebSocket, and then we log it in the console here just so we can see what's going on. We do that same thing for all the encoders. So there, this is all the same aside from the uh, encoder number. So if I go ahead and turn these, you'll see it log those changes. So see, this is encoder 1, so that's on the screen at 205, 240. Encoder 2 is at 405, 240. Encoder 3 is at 605, 240. And encoder 4 is at 805, 240. And you can see if I turn it real fast, those numbers get a little bit bigger to make up for the delay here. So this isn't super fast at sending requests, and my network in particular, my home network here, is not really good at handling all that many packets that quick. So I put a little delay in here and just handle that in like a buffer sort of created by the Rotary IRQ library. So if I go ahead into MA, you will see that this is in fact changing encoder values in MA. These encoders will always align with the bank of encoders that you have selected. So if I jump between these, so if I go to dimmer, encoder 1 will be the dimmer, and encoder 2 will be, this is a set of Chevet Rogue RX2 washes. So they have sort of like the Mac Ara backgrounds. So that is the intensity for those. It's very convenient that the web browser session happens to basically mirror the actual desktop session. So if I select different tabs here, it changes not only in the browser, but in the desktop session. So that makes that work correctly. So if you were just using this, you don't have to, you know, have this change what tab it's in. You can just change it here and it'll change it in the browser. So that is that. This is just the first prototype that I'm probably going to use in ESP32 once I put this into a little bit nicer prototype. I'm going to print a case and we'll go ahead and show you that next. Before I put this together fully, I just wanted to show you what it looks like in here. So I went through and I got some smaller encoders. So I was going to use these encoders and they have the little, the little board down there and I was going to move the pins to the back and everything. It was going to go in this slightly longer case, or slightly taller case. But uh, I broke a few too many of these, so I went and bought shorter ones. Let's see if I can grab one here. That uh, don't have the board, so you can see how much shorter the shaft is on those. And we don't need the board because the uh, ESP32 has internal pull-up resistors. So I just took advantage of those. I soldered a uh, negative all the way through there. Um, and some of those little DuPont cables. And so this board will sit in this. I've got screw holes there for it. Let's see if I can get at the seat how it'll sit. So it'll sit like that. This will all go together. You'll see where the screws go. And then you still have access to the port underneath and you can go out whatever way you may want. But yeah, 
So I'll go ahead and put this together and we'll see the final product. All right, and just like that, we have uh, somewhat of a final product. Let me go ahead and switch the camera here and we'll have a closer look. Uh, I apologize for any latency. This is coming into OBS over NDI. Could be a little slow. Anyway, so here's what it looks like. Pretty simple. Got some screws and such. Uh, and four encoders. You'll notice there's not five. So what that fifth encoder on the console controls is these things over here. I didn't see a ton of use in putting that into this. I have touch screens I use. It wouldn't be hard to add a fifth encoder, but I just didn't. So this is what we have. So let's go ahead and demonstrate. Uh, so you'll see if I turn the first encoder that it reacts in MA. Second encoder, it reacts. Third encoder, it reacts. Let me go ahead and pull up something that lets me use the fourth encoder. Let's see here. Let's grab the washes. Uh, I don't know if that's going to... Yeah, you can see that it changed it. Let's go to color and we should be able to find something. There we go. That's a bad example. That one doesn't want to change. Here we are. So now you can see that fourth encoder working. I think this page will demonstrate all of them. Currently, I don't have the buttons hooked up to anything. I'll probably make it so that when you push it, it's like clicking on the uh, on the parameter on screen. I've seen other people do that. Speaking of other people who have done this, as I've done research into this, after I decided to go the WebSockets route, I discovered that somebody wrote a Lua script to do this with MIDI, sort of in MA. I still elected to build this because it's really nice to be able to just plug it in and like it's not using any extra pieces of software on the MA machine or anything like that. Uh, it just kind of plugs in and works. So that is a, a nice thing. Now, I will make the code and all of this available. You will have to edit all of this, of course, to make it work for your system. I'm probably just going to leave it like this. I might make it so that it's a text file for config instead of going and editing the code. But I really do like how easy this code is to understand. I could refactor it, but it's 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 just easy to, to see and understand what's going on as it currently stands. So I'll likely leave it like that. But I don't know. We'll see. I'll put up a GitHub with all the 3D files, all the code, and all of that. So go ahead and look in the description for that. Also, go ahead and subscribe. I should have a lot of interesting things coming up. I've actually gone through since the last video. Well, I think the last video I posted was the Fiber Splicer. At the time, I used to work for an ISP. Then I went and worked full-time for a jazz venue and recording studio. And now I have a whole new job at a really, really cool venue. So keep an eye out for new videos even as I just do projects. For example, I bought a really, really old house uh, about a year ago, and I've been in the process of redoing it. So there will be some interesting videos around that. So go ahead and keep an eye out for that. I should have like a preliminary video going up, but I'm putting all the smarts in it. So the house was built in 1795, and uh, I'm bringing it up to 2023 uh, levels of technology. So it should be pretty cool. One piece of software I'm writing that's already sort of most of the way to functional is a system I'm calling Conicam Control. It's for controlling PTZs because current free software kind of isn't super good. For example, if you want to use it with an Xbox controller, even though the joysticks are analog, it doesn't, they generally are sort of digital controls. So you're either going full speed or you're going no speed. So I'm improving upon that. I'm also adding options for other camera motion controls. For example, maybe if it's on a dolly of some sort, a motorized dolly or a slide, I'm adding controls for that and possibly building some hardware. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, it could be interesting for this new job because a large part of this company is cinematography for things like marketing and just general video projects of different sorts, music videos, things like that. I'm also hoping to build a full control surface, um, maybe call it like open surface, where it could control anything from MA to maybe OBS or Resolume or whatever you may want, and be a big open control surface, hopefully with some displays that kind of tucks away and folds away, like a real console would that you can put in a flight case. We'll see how that goes. Yet another piece of software that I'm well on my way to creating is a configless comms app. So think something like a ClearCom, but instead of having to buy, you know, five 
$3,000 belt packs and a couple thousand dollar base. It's just some phones on a network that can be used as a comm system. There's no config. As long as everybody's on the same network, it should work. So that's in the process of being created. I have a couple prototypes, and now I'm just in the process of lowering latency and improving reliability. I'm learning Rust and Flutter and all sorts of things uh, to make all of that work. So keep an eye out for that. I'm hoping to post a video showing a prototype of that, and hopefully I'll have that up soon. Anyway, like I said, go ahead and subscribe. Leave a comment if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, and I'll do my best to respond. And thanks for watching. Bye.